This section is about a disease called smallpox, but it's also about a new medical procedure that gets developed called vaccinations. Now, smallpox has been around, it was around in medieval times. Um, by 1700, it was probably as feared as the plague had been because it was a particularly dangerous and particularly unpleasant disease. It would begin with a high fever which might come and go, it might recur. That would then turn into, first of all, flat spots, which would then develop into raised bumps, which would then develop into fluid-filled blisters, which would then scab over. So it could be quite an extensive rash that could cover the body and it would go from spots to bumps to blisters to scabs. In addition to that, smallpox came along with terrible headaches, backache, abdominal pains, vomiting, sorry about this, and because I do have limits, diarrhea which I will just write. But the really scary thing about smallpox is its effects. First of all, between 30 and 60% of everybody who gets this disease dies of it in the 1700s. So it's got a really high death rate. Even the people who survived might be left terribly scarred because the rash would turn into a very disfiguring um, scars in some cases and it could also leave people blind. It's actually the biggest killer of children than compared to any other disease at the time but it does also attack adults as well. So it's scary, it's also contagious. Um, and there are several epidemics during the 1700s of this disease. So there's one in 1722, whoops, go for red. So there's an epidemic in 1722 to 23 she said, having got hold of the right colour. There's an epidemic in 1740 to 42. There's a really serious one in 1796. Um, and these are all quite serious. The one in, oops, so 1722 to 23, 1740 to 42, and 1796. The 1796 one is particularly serious. It actually kills 35,000 people overall and it hits London particularly badly. So in London there are 3,548 deaths from this. There are estimated to have been 11 epidemics in London. It's particularly bad in cities at this time. So smallpox is not just very dangerous, it's also very extensive. Now there does seem to be a solution that is brought to Britain in 1721, round about here. And this is the practice of something called inoculation. It is spelt with one N. I have already made this mistake once today. So take care to notice that, one N in inoculation, and I've written it in capital letters because it's important. An inoculation um, is a practice actually that comes from China and Asia. It was actually brought to Britain by a gentlewoman called Lady Mary Montague. And she was inoculated herself 
while she was in Istanbul and she survived a smallpox epidemic that actually killed her brother. So she brought the practice and knowledge of the practice back to Britain. And the way that inoculation works, write it again up here with one N. There we go. And the way that this works is that a doctor would make a small cut or wound on the patient and then, and I'm sorry because this is gross, they would take pus from a smallpox blister and they would rub it into the wound. And the idea is that you give someone a mild dose of smallpox. So it's intended to cause a mild dose of smallpox. Better still, the patient might find that they don't contract smallpox at all. And this is because smallpox Small packs. Smallpox is one of those diseases that you can't catch twice. Once your body has fought it off, it knows how to do it. So you don't catch smallpox twice. So inoculation is intended to give people a mild dose of smallpox that they can survive quite easily and then they will be safe. The only problem is that first of all, well the only problems are because there's more than one, first of all you don't know or you can't guarantee that the patient will only get a mild dose. They could get a serious dose of smallpox and that could be dangerous, it could kill them. Secondly, they are contagious after they've been inoculated. They could pass smallpox on to other people. So after inoculation, patients were supposed to spend some time in what's called quarantine, which is where they're isolated from everybody so they can't pass it on. And then finally, the problem with inoculation is that it's expensive. A lot of the doctors who offer inoculation are very high status, well paid doctors, and they can charge up to £20 for an inoculation. Now, this is probably the equivalent of £1,500 in today's money, and most people just couldn't afford it, so it wasn't available to them. So, inoculation looks like it might help and in some cases it works but it's not really a miracle solution for smallpox and it's at this point while we're contemplating miracle solutions for smallpox that we're going to introduce this man this is edward jenner he's a doctor well he was a doctor he studied under a famous surgeon called john hunter and in the 1770s he becomes a country doctor in Gloucester. And one of the things that he notices, I, I will need to rub that out and write it somewhere else where there's room, pardon me. So one of the things he notices while he's um, being a country doctor in the country is that Milkmaids and other people who work around cows don't seem to get smallpox. And Jenna wonders why this is. What they do get instead is a disease called cowpox. Now cowpox isn't all that serious. It causes a mild rash. People usually get over it relatively easily and it doesn't cause any long-term problems like smallpox does. But when people have had cowpox, Jenna realizes that they don't get smallpox and he begins to wonder if this could be a solution and a way of protecting people against smallpox. So in the 1790s, he begins to do some experiments. Now, this is because of the Renaissance and because of changes to the way that people approach science, Jenner does approach this quite scientifically. And he conducts experiments. So in the 1790s, Jenner experiments with this. Very famously, he conducted 
an experiment on an eight-year-old boy where he inoculated, one N, he inoculated an eight-year-old boy who was otherwise healthy, and his name has gone down in history, it's James Phipps. And first of all, Jenna inoculates him with cowpox, and then he inoculates him with smallpox to see if he'll get it. And then he inoculates him with smallpox again, eight months later. And James Phipps does not get cowpox, which is good really, because it would be an awful story if he did. Sorry, he does not get smallpox. However, this isn't the only experiment that Jenna conducts. He actually conducts 23 others including one on his own 11 month old baby. And the results show time and again that people who have had cowpox do not get smallpox. Jenna also studies about a thousand cases where inoculations, one N, Sorry, of, I was so, so caught up in my ends, I forgot to write of. So 1,000 cases of inoculation failures, where inoculations don't work. Until finally, in the 19, sorry, in the 1790s, he is ready to release his ideas. Now, he starts off in 1797, let's bring it over here, by writing a paper for the Royal Society. about this. And that's in 1797. However, the biggest impact comes when he publishes his book on this. Now, as is often the way, and you as we get closer and closer to Victorian times, you notice that the titles of things get longer and longer. So this has quite a long title. Please bear with me while I write it. Um, but this is called An Inquiry into the Causes and Effects of the varioli vaccine. or cowpox. And in this book, Jenner introduces a revolutionary idea. He suggests that it is possible to guarantee people protection against smallpox by giving them cowpox. And he calls this process a vaccination. And it's funny, the word vaccination is actually named after cows because the Latin for cows is vacca. And that's because Jenna has discovered that cowpox will protect people against smallpox.